Insurance isn't our only passion at UFG Insurance. We're dedicated to supporting the communities where we live and work. We proudly offer our employees paid time off to volunteer. Their work is making a positive difference across the U.S. UFG's Go Beyond Award is presented to one employee annually for exceptional community service. Striving to deliver on our promises is more than what we do. It's who we are. For a company promising community support, think UFG. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to session seven within the community and diversity, equity, and inclusion track, um, answering a neighborhood's needs. I am uh, Quinn Pettifer. I'm the manager of brand initiatives for the Gazette and um, have the privilege of moderating this fantastic session. Um, just a couple of um, quick uh, things I want to give uh, uh, much deserved props to our sponsors. I know you're hearing a lot about them throughout, but Believe me, they deserve it. They make this conference possible. Um, thank you to our presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest, our community track sponsor, UFG Insurance, um, as well as our diversity, equity, and inclusion sponsors, which is Inclusive ICR, um, and Content Block sponsor for DEI, which is Cedar Rapids Bank and Trust. So lots of great support there. Um, we have a fantastic panel joining us today with a lot of knowledge on this topic. So just a reminder, um, our tech host, Althea, is going to be helping us out. Um, be sure to be putting questions in the Q&A portion of Whova, and um, she will do, uh, she'll be sending them uh, directly to me. So uh, one thing about this session um, that uh, I was, as we were chatting before the beginning here is, there's a lot of pieces to this. Um, going and being able to um, go to a trusted place where people are gathering um, to be able to get the resources that they, as an individual and or their families need. Um, there's um, levels of trust. Um, there's the physical space um, that's, that's necessary. And then of course, there's the partnerships that are required to make this happen. So we're gonna look at both of those angles the physical space, and then the experience itself. Um, and then of course, um, our um, the partnerships that need to happen in order to, to make these so successful. So um, with that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists and I'm gonna be asking them to actually uh, go around this space. Um, again, I'm so fortunate because we have this panel um, that's taken this concept and they are doing it in very different ways. So I think as a viewer, you're gonna get a lot out of this conversation. Um, so first uh, with me, um, Stephanie Carter, who is with Wellington Heights Community Church. Stephanie, thanks for being here. We have Samira Abdallah with the Coralville Public Library, also a community uh, leading the community ambassador program. And then we have Angie Jordan with the South of Six Business District. So thank you very much, all of you for being here. So, um, Samira, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you. And if you wouldn't mind just telling, uh, explaining a little bit about the mission of the program that, that you're overseeing and how you've taken this concept of, of, of um, that centralized source for resources and doing fantastic work. Yeah, um, thank you for introducing me. Uh, my name is Samira Abdallah, and I am, my title is called Community Resources Navigator. Um, so I am based at the Coralville Public Library in Coralville. Um, so the, com the Community Resources Navigator Program was designed to connect community members uh, facing challenges in their everyday lives related, related to economic barriers with community resources. Um, so through this position, I assist individuals and or families with limited access to resources, and um, I invite community to events designed to address their needs. Um, so one part of my my job was to create a community ambassador program, just like Quinn mentioned. Um, and the goal of this program was to um, reach segments of Coralville population that are not um, currently connected to vital resources and services. And those tends to be uh, the minority populations, um, the people that no don't normally come to the library seeking assistance. Um, and the ambassadors were expected to kind of bridge the gap uh, by disseminating information about existing programs in Coralville and in Johnson County um, and uncovering unmet needs. Um, so our our CAP members, we, so Community Ambassador Program stands for CAP, um, it consists of nine members, um, Coralville residents, and um, they are well-established in like the connection to underserved communities. 
Um, and within our nine members, we have eight different languages spoken. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but Coralville is more diverse per capita. It's the most diverse city in Iowa per capita. And we wanted our community ambassador members to kind of mirror that. Um, so, and then our goal for the program, yeah, like I said, to mirror the diversity of the Coralville, um, because it's so, since our ambassadors speak eight different languages, Coralville uh, 2020 census, I think showed that um, 19, there were 19 primary languages spoken by Coralville residents. So it's um, the whole point, the whole goal of the ambassadors is to kind of meet people where they are, um, bridge the gap that exists between the resources and the people kind of getting connected to those resources um, and also kind of um, help our our members, our community members that are kind of lacking the resources they need. Absolutely. Samir, how many CAB members are there currently? Currently, to begin with, we had 12 um, and we, we are a year into the program. So we have nine CAP members currently and we have eight different languages spoken. Wow, that is incredible. Very impressive. I'm excited to learn a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephanie, um, Stephanie Carter. Stephanie, you wanna introduce yourself again and just a little bit more about the work that you're doing. Yeah, so I'm Stephanie Carter. I'm the spiritual formation and teaching pastor at Wellington Heights Community Church. We're based in the neighborhood of Wellington Heights in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Now, the unique thing about our organization is we value proximity. Um, so my husband, Pastor Kian, and I, we launched Wellington Heights Community Church in the neighborhood that we lived. And Wellington Heights is known for being a marginalized um, neighborhood and community in Cedar Rapids. And we um, value an approach of proximity and coming alongside and building mutual and trusting relationships. And we believe that this approach can engage us for the long haul in the Wellington Heights community. Um, one thing about um, our organization was we launched in March of 2020, that fateful month when COVID-19 hit. And um, we had an original plan of our organization being rooted in community development, but as we listened to our neighbors, we quickly needed to change our response from community development to crisis response, and shortly after we had the derecho, um, and so that extended our um, need for a crisis response, and now we are back into flipping into that community development model. We want to be more, known more for a community center than necessarily a church. In fact, our kids' classmates, someone just told our son, Miles, I can't believe that's a church. I thought it was a community center with all the kids playing basketball and being a hub for resources and gathering in the community. Um, so our hope is to see not only people flourish, but the neighborhood of Wellington Heights flourish. Absolutely. And Stephanie, I'm glad that you mentioned um, just, you know, people like, I didn't know it was a church. It, I, I think that is one of the the focus. I, I will often hear about yourself and, and Pastor Kian and, um, you know, yeah, we're going to the, the, the center. And I'm like, well, oh, oh, okay. I know, it, which is fantastic. Um, I'm curious, on average, how many community events are you affiliated with in a given year, like in the past 12 months? I mean, it's got to be oh, a lot, too many to count, at least to count. a couple of months, probably. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great balance of not only things that you host, but also the things that you're connecting yourself to. So Absolutely. very cool. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. And last but certainly not least, we got Angie Jordan. Angie, tell us a little bit more about the South of Six. Yeah, so the South of Six is, Iowa City South of Six is a business district. Um, there are about 43 of these types of business districts that are SMIDs, self-supported municipal improvement districts um, across the state of Iowa. And how they're kind of different than other like business districts or main streets is that the property owners, the commercial property owners um, in a very specific geographic location. So mine is like these streets here, um, they are buying in to making the first investment on improvement by self-taxing. And we also started this whole, what is a SMID and should we do a SMID over here in the South District of Iowa City where a lot of marginalized folks, a very diverse and extremely like, densely um, residentially packed with folks over here and still expanding too residentially, commercially. Um, but this idea that this commercial district, it didn't exist we want to make improvements so that it does. But I would say the thing that is really unique about our SMID 
um, is that it was not spearheaded by capitalism. It was not spearheaded by businesses wanting to make more money and take advantage of things. Oh, it was actually spearheaded by the South District Neighborhood Association and the businesses that really aligned the nonprofits that are over here. We have a very densely concentrated nonprofits with our community uh, food shelter, uh, domestic violence and shelter house. We've got a lot of not just the post office and businesses, but we've got a lot of nonprofits over here. So this geographic area already kind of was a center for things. It just didn't have a shared vision or mission. So through economic development, my, my background is in youth advocacy and family support. I never thought in a million years that I'd be back in my hometown um, working on economic development, but there's just a bigger punch, a more sustainable effort that can tap into our natural resiliency on the side of town and prioritizing the folks who are most impacted by low literacy rates, by crime, by poverty, by allowing folks like me who live here to actually be the executive director of economic development in a geographic location. And it allows for us to have an identity, to share the identity, to tap into like Greater Iowa City Inc. or um, the different municipalities, go after funding or representation and inform strategic plans that sometimes they forget about us or we haven't organized or figured out a way how to advocate. So through South of Six, we're able to be a team, but we're also able to have a voice in what we want for our side of town. Okay, so first off, Angie, I am so proud that you could just rattle off SMID, <laughs> the SMID acronym. Like, in you must do it in your sleep, I'm guessing, um, because that is not an easy one. I've had to, I've had to explain the SMID acronym before, but you got it, girl. Um, and second, um, just what a really creative, unique approach um, to what's often looked at as, you know, you think of SMID districts, you you think of, you know, a lot of the aesthetics and the brick and mortar, and um, certainly that's important, but to be able to take um, the information of the lives and, and, and what is happening and occurring and applying that to how do we be a little bit more strategic about um, phases of development, um, that is such a cool way of addressing um, the topic, the, the addressing the neighborhood needs. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and how long have you, how long has South by South been in existence? South of six. Yeah. So health, South of Highway six is where we get the so six from. Right, um, right. It took about two years. We started the education um, mm -hmm. of what is a SMID in the commercial district and also in the residential district uh, at, at the beginning of 20. 21. So we were asking folks to consider taxing themselves during a pandemic. Um, right. And so it took about two and a half years to educate folks about what is that? Why is that investment actually going to pay off? The, the private investment is going to we're going to be able to leverage it later on. Um, so we started back in 2021. We incorporated in 2022. And then I was hired as the executive director, but I was an incorporator and a founder. Um, I'm also the neighborhood association president and founder of that as well. Um, so been doing the work, but this is a tool that we can just, again, have a much more impactful, sustainable um, and, and legitimized voice to be able to create more signage, wayfinding, public art. Um, we don't endorse certain things, but we can come behind certain things that, you know, quite frankly, might um, give weight to who our city councilors should be or, or what do we want to prioritize at the county level. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. Um, it's new though. It's very, very new. Absolutely, absolutely. Very cool, thank you. See, I'm, I, told, I told these viewers, I said, you know, we've got, we've got this coming from such different angles. Um, it's fantastic. And yet um, some of the approaches, I think you all have stories to share on that. So I'm curious, and Stephanie, I'm going to start with you. At what point in your work, right? Because obviously you established yourself with, you know, with, with a mission and a purpose, um, and then it just, it's, it's evolved very quickly. Um, at what point did you um, really kind of say, okay, this is the time, this is the time to kind of take like our initial intention and take that next step to figure out how to kind of be that centralized location um, for, for the community. Yeah, we knew we always wanted to be a neighborhood hub and to lead as a community center first rather than a church because we know that we need to address the real felt needs of our community. And we believe that 
listening never stops. So we're actually launching a next phase in our value of neighborhood development, which is the Flourishing Neighborhood Index. So it's a process for us to gather data where we'll be employing neighbors to then survey other neighbors and it will give us um, results based on 12 indicators of neighborhood health and flourishing. And from that, we'll co-create our next plan of how we can further be that hub of resource and resilience and gathering for our community. Excellent. That's a real, I mean, being able to have that information and being able to take that information in for like the next step is, is critical. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Samira, I'm, I'm curious um, because, I mean, you have this dynamic, dedicated group of individuals that are part of the ambassador program, but that's still a small group to, mm -hmm. to, to conquer what you're trying to conquer. How do you identify um, what it, like the, the resources that you need? I mean, in your introduction, you talked about, I mean, we, we've identified that there are eight primary languages that we really need to make sure that we have represented within our ambassadors. I mean, that's just one of several different needs that I'm sure you've been mm -hmm. identifying over since the start of the program. Can you take us through um, how you identify or how you've been on collecting the resources and the partnerships that will that will help your your program thrive? Yeah, um, I think one really important, again, I've been doing this for a year and um, I've learned the importance of collaboration with other local agencies. Um, we have a huge partnership with the Coralville Food Pantry. And um, so getting the information, um, working with other local organizations really helped. Um, Houses into Home is one, one other, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but um, other organization that we work really closely um, with to kind of get information and they tap into our, our uh, ambassadors to kind of help them um, translate when they have uh, when they're going to houses and trying to help families they reach out to me and then um, they kind of um, ask for a specific language they need translation for um, so I guess like at the beginning of the community the creation of the community ambassadors we did a lot of um, outreach programs I guess you can say we went to the city con uh, city uh, the city of Coralville administration me meetings informed them about our cap members um, so that other city departments, if they need assistance, we have this um, amazing group of people that are ready to assist. Um, we've had, so again, my part, the partnership with the Corville Food Pantry is huge. Um, so, and I don't know if you guys know, but the Corville Pan Food Pantry ho um, hosts a like quarterly community meals. And during these community meals, our CAP members are um, kind of like intermingling with the community members. Um, so they're like interacting and kind of like sending the message out. These group of people are here to assist. Um, and then we do have a website too that loops off of the library. Uh, it's a community ambassador uh, program. And then that website has their contact information, their email. So should the community need to reach out to them one-on-one, -on -one, they can like easily tap into that resource. Um, and then also as part of the CAP program, we meet quarterly to kind of like for them to give us feedback about what what needs they see um, in the community and what needs they see within their group of people. Because um, a lot of them are like in so many different groups, WhatsApp chat. And so they, they do like have connection with the community. And so during these quarterly meetings, we get back to like together and kind of gather the information to kind of uh, pass it on to other city departments and see what how we can address those needs. Um, yeah, I think wonderful. That the quarterly meetings. It sounds like that's been a, a, a real critical piece of being able to mm -hmm. kind of help the partnerships grow and also just seeing like we're seeing these consistent patterns. If a group of you comes back and seven of the eight are like, yeah, this is coming up. Obviously, this mm -hmm. is something that's kind of trending across your work. Yeah. Uh, which is excellent. That's that's great. Communication is definitely key. Um, so, Ms. Angie, I want to. Um, I, I have the same questions for you. Um, I know it's a little bit of a different process, and you you talked a little bit about it in the introduction. But um, tell me, can you talk a little bit more about how you're identifying the different resources and partnerships that's going to kind of get you from that foundational launch level to to where you want to go next? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the partnerships for us in a SMID, in this type of business district, you have to petition the city. And in that petition, um, we are a 501c6 nonprofit with a board of directors. And our, our board of directors, I mean, they do so much work. And a lot of them are actually paying that tax, right? So they've got vested interests, literally, in this. And so what we worked really hard to do when we were creating that petition, because we knew that the board would be influencing anything we do from, do we do more lunch and learns? Do we have coffee connections? Do we create a master development plan with pilot projects? Um, are we gonna have a, a banner campaign? Um, how do we help support youth programming over here? We knew that our board of directors was going to need to be really, really woke and aware and doing the work already so that none of what we're doing is new. We're just bringing it to the South District, those resources that exist in our community. We're bringing it here. We're not figuring out transportation. We're building literally some of the things that we're doing. We're building here so that those other resources from outside of our community can be here and we're connecting. So our board is made up of uh, 20 different members. Of those members, 15 are voting. And I'll spend a little bit of time here because I think this is, is important for all boards, but especially for a SMID board, they, the 15 have, they have voting rights, right? So if you are a property owner, a big property owner, and um, you own all this, you have the same one vote as somebody who leases in your space. A renter in your commercial space has the exact same power. Those folks have the same power as we have a parking lot. Um, it's managed by the Pepperwood Plaza Association. It's so large, they have the same type of vote. Um, carved out. We have stakeholders. Like I said, we have a lot of uh, nonprofits, some who do own property, some who serve a lot of the folks that are in this district. They have the same voting capacity. There's four of them um, that have the same voting capacity. And we carved out space so that we had votes coming from the neighborhood. So if you're part of the neighborhood association, which there's no dues, if you move into this geographic location, you're automatically a member, you can be on this board with voting rights. And I think initially folks were like, oh my gosh, these folks are all so different and um, you know, motivated in different ways. And what's interesting is when you peel down all the noise and take that out, the focus is on improvement, self-supported municipal improvement district. When you focus all those different diverse voices and backgrounds, whether they're age, political spectrum, whether they're business for a long time or never or nonprofit, whether they rent or own in the area, they all want the same thing. So it's been really, I think, inspiring to show what we on the ground already know that when you have a focused mission, um, you're going to get a lot of buy-in from folks already doing the work. And I think what is is what we need to make sure we do is that we continue to have a business district that brings together those different voices channeled around a very specific strategic line of improvement where we we growing for the we're going for the little easy wins because the other thing that's important to note about a SMID is that yes it's a geographic location but it's also there's a time limit I have five years to prove this is a, there's an investment our board we have five years to show after that we could extend the SMID for another five years or 10 or 20. We could also extend the boundaries. So thinking about those resources that we currently have now, it's who's already doing the work that want to work together. That's how we create our partnerships. And for five years, we're going to prove to those who either don't believe or don't know why they need to join this team to help inform it. So I don't know if that fully answered your question, but I'll stop there. It does. It does. You have a lot of different interests coming together for that, that overall purpose. And I love the fact that the votes are across the board. Like you said, everybody gets a vote. Everybody gets the same the same way. And I'm interested um, in the neighborhood association element to it as well. So, what have you have you do you have a lot of interaction, a lot of participation from the neighborhood association um, group, or is that growing? Absolutely. So again, uh, the business district was spearheaded by the neighborhood association. Um, mm -hmm. So they continue to be a force that also reminds us, hey, this is what we were hoping for. They're, they're one voice, right? With right. others. Um, but it's, it's been amazing to be able to continue some of their traditions that these volunteers and these residents who have day jobs and families, they don't have to have that burden of planning the national night out or the team up to clean up or um, getting silent auction gifts from businesses for their fundraiser. You know, they're able to shift some of that work, that unpaid work 
onto um, economic development, picking up some of that load and really reinvesting it into the, the thriving business district, which if you have one of those in your neighborhood, if you have a thriving business district in your neighborhood, the revitalization efforts, again, aren't just going to be sustainable. They're going to be larger, right? So I think something that's important, and I don't know if we'll touch on it, but whenever somebody gives me a microphone is um, we will improve this area. Property values will go up. Change is here. It's coming. How do we safeguard and inform it so that it's relevant, but so that it doesn't displace those doing the work and those who need this and deserve it most? That's part of why um, the residents piece in this is so big because they're also helping to safeguard this is ours um, as it gets better and awesome we're not going to allow it to be taken away that that ownership behind it absolutely thanks angie stephanie i wanted to um comment um, on just we talked a little bit about it earlier which is just the number of um grassroots neighborhood focused um events and experiences um that wellington heights uh, community church has led but then you have been a part of, how have you, can you talk a little bit about the partnerships that you've identified, the reason, the, the process of identifying, we really need this in order to grow here, um, whether that be your events um, to gather people to distribute resources or the resources themselves. So just talk a little bit more about your partnerships. Yeah, absolutely. So our partnerships have been rooted in like, discovered based on listening and understanding what felt needs are, what are strengths we can continue to build on. And also, like Angie was saying, figuring out who is excited to work together as a community. I think that's so important to identify who wants to join together. I don't think that community development can be done in a silo or like solo organizational approach. We need to link arms and work together as neighbors and with a multi-sector response. So in some of our listening that was done both informally just as neighbors and you know community members and the more formal um, listening with surveys. Um, we found that one of the needs was positive um, like things for youth to do. So we started doing peace walks as a community and offering a chance for youth to speak and share and inspire all of us. Um, we also knew that some there's needs for things to do after school. So we installed a basketball court. We have snacks and waters available. Um, a few other things, we have Coder Dojos and partner with Nubo Co. And so kids are learning how to code and program and all the brilliant things I learn alongside them. It's amazing. Um, we also noticed that there was a ask for being inspired and being reminded of that there is hope. Um, we've had a hard few years collectively, haven't we? And so we wanted to use art as a way to inspire us as a community. So we had several um, art projects. We have two murals that we completed together as neighbors, peace tables in the back. Most recently, we recycled lids that you can't recycle, and we glued them on um, some wooden letters that say peace, and they're displayed on the corner um, by our peace house. So it's all about listening for us, and um, we're really thankful for all the people that are eager to join. And we also were just recently nominated um, to receive solar panels on our building, so we'll be a resiliency hub in light of a major power outage like we experienced in the derecho. So we have actually have a celebration coming up at the end of the month. So wonderful! I the listening sessions are so critical, especially like you said. There's um, a building of trust, um, which um, and again, every panelist is coming at this from different angles. But um, within your group, especially, just having those conversations and just having it be a space of being able to be very open about um, what what the concerns are or some opportunities or dreams, aspirations, that's, that is, uh, that's a very um, intense process, but sounds like it's a well worth uh, initiative. That's wonderful. So Samara, I'm going to turn it to you now. Um, I am so curious as to how um, the clients, the, 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 the families and the individuals that you've been working with and, and cab um, ambassadors have been working with, um, what has been their response? How have they been helping you grow the program? How um, what's been the feedback? What's yeah, just share a little bit yeah. about about the experience and the interactions with them. Yeah, so um it's I think a lot of them are surprised that there's someone at the library that can sit down with them and do a whatever it is like search for, I don't know, 
um the where like you know just for housing or job search and stuff like that so um it's at the beginning it's funny because i think i got the job and then the first like day i helped someone that needed help looking for a job application or um so it's there's been a lot of it's growing it's going fast and the words of uh, mouth is um about the position and my job um so how has it grown i've done a lot of i guess like side programs that i that i i i did to kind of grow this position and to increase awareness especially among the individuals that don't normally come to the library um one program i created is called chat and chai um so on tuesdays um this program i make homemade chai um and it's the whole idea of why i created this was to make it so that i am approachable um so in the our library we have a cafe area that used to be a cafe but now it's just a community space um so i have a desk like a public desk out there that um that i have like office hours out there when individuals come in and they see me there um they just come and ask me questions and in that space on Tuesdays I provide chai and some pastries and the number of people that are coming to that program is just crazy um the highest number of people we had I believe it was like 92 or 93 and each it, this happens every Tuesday um uh, people come to it um and it's it's been a program that I just put chai out and and people just come to me and ask me for assistance and 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 that that's exactly why I wanted it to be it's like an informal way of being approached being the community and they come to you um and then the other i guess aspect of that is um we do have a ELO class at the library and um free ELO class in the evening so periodically i go to the ELO class and talk to them and inform them about my position, my work. And then I always tell them about chat and chai. And, and that's a good um, aspect. Like a lot of them are looking for a space where they can practice their English with just other community members, because that's exactly what chat and chai is. Anyone is welcome. Come get to know the community members while drinking a very delicious chai um, and just conversing with community. And that's a, the best way to do, to practice your English is just like that. So, and so it, it, me going to the ELO class, kind of telling them about my position and this program kind of increased like the, um, the number of people that come as well as I think uh, the number of my, like the English speaking students that normally don't, they, the only reason they come to the library might be just to attend the ELO class and leave they're more prone to actually be like, oh, this is a really cool space. There's chat and I get to kind of converse with people. It kind of takes that that um, nerve. I don't know, like English is not my first language. So it's at the beginning, it's kind of hard to speak the language confidently. So providing a space that they can communicate with others um, really helped a lot of our patrons at the library. That's a lot of chai. For nine, it, 90 people. It is. <laughs> That's amazing, though. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that as, you know, people return and come back, they see familiar faces. They're like, oh, oh yeah, we met, you know, a couple of Tuesdays ago. And um, mm -hmm. that, that's got to help help get the word out. Um, we have regular. Fantastic. Yeah, we have a lot of regular chat chai, chai and chai people. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, um, so that actually, I, I think, goes into um, one question that I have for all three of you, which is cross training. Because while you all are taking answering a neighborhood's needs in a diff very different approach, um, the one common that you all have is staff of one, one person of one, empowerment of you know maybe one or two. Um, you, I'm sure you know all have wonderful volunteer bases and people that are there to to help in any way, shape, or form that they can. Um, but this work is so big. And so how do you, who are, are you cross training others? Are you, are you, how are you kind of helping build your own network of people? Because this work can be exhausting, however angle, whatever angle you're looking at. And Angie, I'm going to start with you because I know you are, I mean, you've got a wonderful <laughs> board, but you got, you're also a one woman show. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, 
I think I think the first thing um, is like I don't know anything about economics, but at the end of the day, like while there are lots of connections and there's a lot of it can be overwhelming for me, just boiling it down to it's very simple. It's all about relationships and all the professional and personal and volunteer or family oriented or friend things, all those transferable skills you get or figure out or fail and then try to figure out or whatever. Those are all that everything that I bring to this position and having the confidence that I'll figure it out and or I'll tap people that I trust or that I can come to know um, because I'm one person and it's also not all my work to do right? If we're going to have systemic change and like change hierarchical structures, I can only enter in certain spaces. So for my own like capacity, that's one thing, but it's also, I think, really important um, that I've learned is to lean on those who are currently in power and, and help hold them accountable as they've asked the South of Six to do um, when we have these big asks. Our, our city has had some leftover um, ARPA funding, American Relief Fund uh, money. They had $500,000 um, and our annual budget is, is 1,000. And they were looking uh, at creative ways to split it in, in economic development because we existed. South of Six gets to inform the city we get half of that and the downtown district gets half of that. We're very different smids, right? But this idea of whether or not I was doing this job, I would be going after that as a neighborhood resident, seeing that money needs to be spent. Um, the other piece is, again, we don't have to know everything, um, but we also have to trust that there are others out there who haven't yet risen. So we need to empower and build confidence. Um, the South District uh, diversity market, it started as 25 uh, vendors during the pandemic when everything was shut down, predominantly women, predominantly folks of color. Um, and over three years, we grew it to about 60 different vendors. All of those small businesses incubating, they, they have the answer. They need the platform, the space, the consistent effort, um, the opportunity to practice using their voice and doing it together. Um, and they they build their own coalitions, right? So a lot of my work is about continuing to connect people and ideas, um, nudging folks. Remember, you said you'd do that. Um, so those are all skills that honestly, I feel like we as human beings collect. And now I get to hone it and get paid for it. I don't have to volunteer. Um, I want to make sure that other folks, that this is a normalized thing, particularly for marginalized folks who don't typically get to sit in the executive director seat of, of an economic development uh, organization. Absolutely. Well, and taking taking that enthusiasm and that excitement, um, it's got to be contagious. It's got to be contagious to the people that you're that you're working with. Thanks, Angie. Stephanie, I have the same question for you because again, it's a small but mighty group. But how do you how do you empower others and and kind of help that cross training initiative? Yeah, so we are part of um, a larger network called Christian Community Development Association, and their mission is to train, inspire, and connect people, not only to see people holistically restored, but communities to flourish. And so they provide great resources. We were just at the national conference last week with a group of about 10 people from the neighborhood. Um, and so we want to provide opportunities for us to be inspired, to be trained, and then to connect with each other and a broader network of people who are joining in this work, because it can feel lonely. It's a long journey. It's exhausting, but we get to do it together. And I think when we get to look up and out and see all the amazing things just from what's happening here on this panel, like that's inspiring. And I think as we can continually point people to use their agency, we all have something to gain and to receive in a community. It's a give and take. And the more that we can help inspire people to use their agency, I think that is what um, helps build our capacity, build our team. Um, is that agency building and training and connecting. We also just try to um, have the philosophy of our approach to community development, just immerse in absolutely everything that we do. So that no matter what that you're coming to, um, that you're experiencing and feeling um, the vibe, the approach to community development, and that hopefully that you would want to jump into that as well and be part of it. I love that you had folks from the the neighborhood um, attend that conference with you to be able to share their perspective and their stories. That, that is fantastic. Thanks, Stephanie. Samara, I had the same question. And again, um, I know it's there's there's the group of them, there's the group of ambassadors, um, but then you've got 
you're located in the library, which, um, you know, any community library is one of the most highest uh, in terms of uh, in and out traffic. You're um, you're interacting uh, with a lot of different folks on any given day. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you're doing to kind of expand the knowledge. You've got the core group, but then mm -hmm. how are you kind of helping um, empower others to, to be in this work? Um, I think one big part for me is my the connection with other local agencies. Um, so we we um, host the University of Iowa Mobile Health Mobile Clinic here at the library once a month, but now it's every other month. Um, so we every time they come, I tap into all my connection, like the Johnson County uh, Social Services. Um, so the University of Iowa Health is it's all about like basic health screening and stuff. So I added a social service health clinic, social service clinic to that because I don't know if you know, but Corville is, um, there's a lot of social services that exist in Iowa City and they're not located in Corville, even though it's for the whole Johnson County. Um, and there's a transportation barrier. So what I've done is to have those agencies come to the Corville Public Library and kind of table during when the mobile clinic is here. So those are, um, it's been really helpful to have Corville residents kind of like, you know, oh, I didn't know, like, you know, I can use those resources. I didn't, and um, it kind of addresses the barrier, the transportation barrier. So I do reach out to those. Um, another huge partnership I mentioned again is the Corville Food Pantry. Um, I go when they're open, I go to their um, uh, opening hours, table there, provide my information. Um, and then in return, uh, they also provide the pastries I serve during chat and chai. The Corville Food Pantry kind of delivers them for me um, or I pick them up sometimes. But yeah, so that partnership really is very important to to kind of running my my job, my duties. Um, again, and I have a really awesome co-workers at the Corville Public Library that are always, um, anytime someone asks for me, they write, you know, they uh, make it easier for me to kind of reach out to those people. So they collect uh, whatever necessary information that's um, needed um, and kind of make help me make appointments with each individual so I can um, meet with people one on one. Because like you said, there's so many tasks to do. Um, it's just one minute you're in the next minute. You're like, where did Samira go? Like, where did she disappear to? It's just running around, you know, um, and it's it's coworkers that are just constantly getting a message for me. Um, from patrons that come to the library. that's That's been really helpful. Again, and then going back to my CAP members, they volunteer uh, to, through, like a lot of through, uh, my, they volunteer uh, many of my programs. Uh, a few of them come and make chai with me in the morning doing chat and chai. Um, they come to chat and chai and socialize with people, especially at the beginning. They kind of helped me kick off the, the program and make it, um, so that it's a lovely environment for people to be in. So I have um, a lot of agencies and like um, my coworkers and just people that are willing to step in and help out. And I always ask for help too. So it's, 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 it's been good. <laughs> Absolutely. There is that, that need to have, you know, like you said, it's, it's each one of you does such amazing work, but you, you gotta have, <laughs> you gotta have that, that expanded reach of, of support. Um, one question I have on here that um, I we touched on a little bit in the beginning is uh, that element of trust and mm -hmm. and um, whether it is venturing into a new um, uh, core district um, initiative or you know one on one um, vulnerability of um, you know needing some resources and maybe just you know feeling a little uneasy about um, where to go or how to ask for them. Um, each one of you represents um, a requirement of building an environment of trust. How do you do that? How do you how do you cultivate that that environment of trust so that individuals, businesses, families um, can can have the best experience uh, working with your organization? I'll just lob this to anybody that wants to take it first. <laughs> I think trust is it's really. Um... In my opinion, like you also have to first have trust in yourself if you're going to exude asking for somebody else's trust. Um, and sometimes it's a very humbling experience to say, I don't know. But the more you say it, the more you build that muscle that it's it's not that you're 
you you don't know it's it's like you want to know you're curious you've been asking us questions on this panel there's this desire right and that is what i think can be contagious and when you build that culture that shared culture of curiosity then you're bringing in opportunities to create safe spaces that have to be maintained. You know, uh, we're humans. We, we, we uh, don't get everything right. But being able to come in and say, whoa, that, that, this is not a safe space. How do we create a safe space and come back? So that willingness to trust yourself, to stay curious, and then to allow folks to see when you make an error that y- y- it's front and center. It's very transparent. And that there is, I don't know how to say this gently, but I don't know when I'm wrong unless somebody tells me. So there's also this reciprocal, um, I need you uh, to tell me when something's wrong or when something's off because I need to trust you. So there's that mutual vulnerability that has to be in, like Stephanie was saying, baked into everything you do, whether it's an event or uh, a marketing flyer, right? How do you weave that in that this is a safe space to engage? Um, and and that that's tricky. Absolutely. We're all human and, and having that out there for the world to accept and, and like I said, contagious. <laughs> Who else wants to answer that? I can go. Um, so for me, it's, I think, giving the individuals I work with and help the options to, uh, giving them like, not telling them what to do, but giving them the option of to choose what they want to do. If they come to the library and want to speak with me, um, I ask them, do you want a private space or do you, are you okay meeting at this desk? Um, and giving them the options and explanation, I think, uh, shows them that you, like, you're, you, you respect them. I think trust, it goes hand in hand with respect. Um, and I think the other way I kind of build trust is by cre- creating a sense of community, again, around chat and chai. Um, having conversation openly it's I think sometimes food and delicious delicious chai is all you need to kind of build the trust of the community it's they see that you're putting in the work to to provide that and and also in return they like okay this is a person that I can I can be open to because an example for me is um, there was one particular time I brought out the chai and there's this individual who came into the space got the chai sat down, drank the chai, and then got up again. And he came to me and he was like, are you the lady that helps people with resources? And I was like, yeah. So in, in, that's like a prime example of just providing the space and um, and let people come to you. And I think that's how I've been doing it. And I, I think it's working, uh, unless someone else says otherwise. <laughs> but yeah. The numbers are there. And the numbers. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're headed in the right direction. (laughs) Thanks, Samira. Stephanie, thoughts on this question, the trust? Yeah, I think for me and my learning journey is that our posture or how we show up is so important and that it be rooted in um, mutuality and humility, vulnerability, and to remove, especially if you're in a community development organization, to try to remove that like giver and receiver dynamic, Mm -hmm. but rather like we're fellow humans on a journey together. Mm -hmm. We can come alongside one another. That for me has been um, a key learning piece in, and it is what guides our organization and me personally and how um, to build trusting relationships across all different kinds of intersections. Absolutely. I'm curious how you keep yourselves inspired by this work. Um, You could be in this for five minutes and feel like, okay, this is a lot. Um, How, how are you, how are you keeping yourself motivated and, and just reminded of the impact that um, these programs and these initiatives are having on the community? For me, um, what inspires me is when an individual walks in that I that I relate to so much um, and I see like my family, my mother, my relatives in, in that person um, and helping even if five, like, you know, five people you help don't really appreciate the work. That one person that appreciates and that you see the, the difference, the smile on their face that it makes, it was all worth it it's that's all that's worth it for me like it's just it's not the the number of people you helped or how busy you work it's it's the quality of the work and 
and um, how much it makes someone else happy and makes their life a little easier. Um, and specifically for me, it's uh, I I have a very soft spot for minority populations, immigrants especially that come here, learn new language and new culture. So if I am able to make that the journey of transitioning in this society in this country a little bit easier, that's all it takes for me to kind of the power I need to push me forward. Excellent. Thanks, Samara. Who else? Mm -hmm. I think what keeps me on the journey of being inspired is how we're all interconnected um, and to keep that in mind and to look up. I am always reminded to look up when I feel like I'm just, you know, stuck to just look up and see the good that's happening. Of course, my faith inspires me and the youth among us inspires me. Last night, we just finished up. We did a three-week program called Hues of You by Dr. Barry. And um, it is a program, well, it's a book, activity book. We turned it into a three-week program um, for kids to consider all of our many hues of skin tone and seeing all the kids come and be inspired to talk about our hues and that we can celebrate and see and honor one another's diversity. So that inspires me. I, I would add to that, um, like Samira was saying, you know, when you see yourself in somebody else, whether it, you have a lot in common or not, but that, that continuing to embrace that and, and knowing that every time you see yourself, hopefully in somebody, they're seeing something in you, whether it's themselves or not, they're, they're, they're believing they're connected, just like Stephanie was saying. And ultimately in those relationships, whatever, whatever it is that we're doing, that there's a sense of you belong, you're mm -hmm. important. And again, I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep saying it unless you believe that, unless I believe that every day and I can eat my lunch and get good sleep and hang out with my friends and, and cry when I need to cry and laugh when I need to laugh. You're going to exude that out to others. And that's, if they believe that, but first you kind of have to believe that. So I think mm -hmm. anybody who's trying to engage with neighbors or residents or people, like there's a lot of internal, internal work we have to do daily um, to continue the grind because there's a really good chance that the goals, our vision, building a multicultural ecosystem, a business renaissance on the south side of town, I might not live to see all that I see in my head, right? All that our board is envisioned. And that's okay, because if we're chipping away and I feel like we, I'm part of something big, um, the sky's the limit. It is, and, and the visions continue, right? So like, there's always like that next big thing. There's always that next, that next opportunity. So I'm curious um, because you know part of part of Iowa Ideas is to inspire other other communities um, across Iowa or even beyond Iowa um, that you know are listening to each one of your experiences and saying you know what something like this might work where we're at. Um, so for for people that are are thinking about um, starting a similar initiative or um, or program within um, their own communities what uh where would you say is like the best place to start what at, so two-parter question what where's the best place to start um and what are some essential ingredients to get started oh yeah i <laughs> Again, just on repeat, I think the first place you have to start is your own capacity and realizing what's important to you. What is it you want to do? Do you do you want that bike to books, little free library initiative? Is that like what you want? Cool. Let's go do it. And then thinking, well, somebody has to make it. Um, and then we got to figure out where we're going to put it. And all those questions, write them down and then find people or organizations that like, oh, they're so, Habitat for Humanity is so good at building things, like boom, do you wanna be a partner? Um, those pieces, get all the questions, blow it up real big, and then find people and places. And sometimes you don't find it, right? That's okay, put it in your pocket, um, go with the pieces you have. And again, the people who show up, the, the municipalities that invest, the organizations, Go with what you have, because at the end of the day, if you're always in that idea mode and you're not doing action, in my opinion, you're not going to learn. But most importantly, you're not going to build a network um, 
of, of folks who are interested in like, gosh, that really didn't work, but let's do it again. And this time, maybe we can figure this part out. So that action piece, I think, has to be woven in to that idea part. Um, and knowing that, I think a little nugget is build in the time for evaluation, because that's great that you got it done, but did it meet the goals? Did it have the outcomes? Because you need to package that and toot your horn real loud so everybody can hear and see your success. It's, it's not a conceited thing to do when you pull something off that nobody's been able to do and you want to template it out so that others are doing it. And that's our new norm, right? There's SMID, self-supported municipal improvement districts in rural Iowa. They're all over the place. I want that because then we're not alone as one of the only um, SMIDs in Iowa that's from neighborhood revitalization. We can create our own networks. So I, I don't know if that fully answered your question, but that's no, what I would say. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love the the analysis part because, you know, you're not going to get everything on the first try. Absolutely. But, but keep going. Absolutely. Tamara, do you, do you, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you. Sorry. Sorry. Can you ask the question yeah. again? I kind of have, a, it gives me a moment to kind of rethink back. Absolutely. So, so the question is, um, we no doubt there's um, there there's viewers and will be viewers that are thinking about um, you know taking one of these examples of answering a neighborhood's needs and applying it in their own communities. Um, so for, for people that are thinking about starting a program or an initiative similar to what you've been doing, um, where where would you tell them to start? Where's the best place to start? And then what are some key ingredients to get started? Mm -hmm. Like you got to have this and you got to do this in order to even yeah, to get it off the ground. Um, I think I piggyback on what Angie just said. Um, questions. I think starting with questions. Um, and kind of writing down your questions and and what are the needs in your community. Um, and putting yourself out there in your neighborhoods. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big program. It doesn't have to be something big. Like it, it could be as simple as volunteering at the neighborhood center or, um, I don't know, city cleanup, whatever it is that start little and then um, kind of continue with it. And it's another example would be a CAP, our community ambassador program. We didn't know what it was gonna be uh, like, cause it's the first ever, it's a pilot uh, program. So just going with it and um, seeing what it can become, I think is the best, the best advice I can get. Like, don't be afraid to start something new. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, I think one thing is it's beautiful that we can see that these approaches look different in every community and it should mm -hmm. because we all have unique contexts that have our own unique great joys and great challenges. And so to be open to what um, is the lived reality in your context and to recognize that maybe you're seeing that through filtered lenses and to take those filters off and to see clearly alongside your neighbors, especially those who may be different from you. And I think um, one other piece, um, Taylor Swift has this great line in a song <laughs> that says, Band-Aids don't fix bullet holes. And I think that is key in community development work. Like a lot of times we try to throw Band-Aids on really hard problems that are complex and nuanced and layered and systemic. So let's not, let's move away from those quick fixes and be rooted in the long haul. And to be rooted in the long haul, we have to take care of ourselves to do some important soul and self-care to keep us doing this work for a long time because we don't want to burn out. We want to stay in it um, for the good of all, for the flourishing of all people. So how many right now are like that song's in your head? Now? Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those viewers, they know that it's, it's in yes. your head. I love it. Thank you. should be talking about community development. <laughs> hey, we can all circle back, right? <laughs> Okay, so we have a couple minutes left here, um, and I have um, just one final question for you, and I'm, I, I, another two for here. So, um, what is the next step, um, or is there a, a, a program, an initiative, something that's happening um, where uh, you're particularly excited about, like that next phase? Um, what is it, and how can people um, learn more and and join in your work? So, Stephanie, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, so a next phase of work happening in Wellington Heights is the Flourishing Neighborhood Index. We're hoping we've been gathering um, informally with a multi-sector of organizations. We have the city and neighbors, schools, all alike that we've been organizing this past year, doing some fundraising. But in January, we'll, 
January, we'll be launching um, the initiative. And you can find out more on our website, which is just wellingtonheightscommunitychurch.org. Excellent. Thanks, Stephanie. Angie? Oh. I can talk. I can. Oh. oh go there ahead. we go. Sorry. I, I have to have permission to speak. <laughs> Um, yeah, our our next big thing really is um, continuing a master development plan uh, project. So this is something, like I said, we only have five years to renew to show that this is an investment. But the cool thing about having a SMID is you have money to actually hire an architect to work on a master development plan and have community input sessions. And uh, we've got surveys now going out after our community input sessions. So if you're interested, you don't even need to be from the South District or Iowa City. The surveys are really informing these six pilot projects that were identified by the investors, but also getting a lot of feedback from other folks in the community. What, what are things that we need to improve on? But here are some starter points. And they're anything from let's build a shelter so that when we have our South District diversity markets or our farmers market, we actually have a functional space to use in our sea of parking lot. Um, how about some of those intersections that need crosswalks? Or um, how can we engage with the city? So there are these different projects that kind of are little, little eggs. And where you all who aren't from our community, your input would be really helpful because what would get you over here? What would get you like, mm, that's exciting. I want to go see that mural. Um, what would get you here? And that, that piece is just, we're going to be doing constant outreach, but then once we figure out what are those pilot projects, what's the sequence, we're going to start executing um, and tapping into funding sources to make them happen. Um, so really excited about it, but also we need to roll into action so that it's completed in five years. You're on a roll. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Angie. And then Samira. Um, ours would be, I guess, uh, our community ambassador program, since we're in year two now, we will be doing a lot of um community uh, a lot of programs here at the library one of the big one we think we're uh, planning on doing is mock interviews where people can come uh, we can uh, we can uh, kind of put a group of subcommittees together that can come and assist people for job interviews like mod to practice like kind of like what job interviews would look like and also citizenship interviews so um hopefully we're in the planning process of that but something like that at the library, a program where the communities can come and benefit from is what we're thinking about. And Chat and Chai is still continuing. So if any of you guys are in town, come to Chat and Chai on Tuesdays. It's, I promise you won't regret it. So yeah. You had me at Chai. So, all right. So that officially wraps up um, a fantastic hour. Thank you for each, each, thank you each of you for all the work that you are doing. Um, it is critical to the strengthening um, and growing of our communities. Thank you for being here. To all of our viewers, we hope that you uh, had a great hour with us. And now um, head on over to the keynote. I'm Frances Haugen. Uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>